Got my guitar, I've got my wine Where we can go taken any job in the world to escape school and fortunately I um, happened to be at a party when a bloke called Alfred Walker, the secretary of Yolumba, just happened to mention that Yolumba was looking for a likely lad, that's why I gave a bit of a sneaker because I don't know whether I would just describe myself thus. However, they offered me the job so I went back and told the head that I'd be leaving at the end of the term. He implored me to stay on, he said I had a brilliant scholastic career ahead of me. I didn't say to him, but he obviously was looking at someone else. <laughs> it's not so. That's how I uh, fell, we might say, into the into the wine industry. And thank God it uh, just uh, you know I couldn't have fluked a better uh, future. I then got the opportunity to get a, the job at Saltram as uh, winemaker and manager of. Saltram Winery, that was in 59, and Saltram were one of the few companies in the, well, certainly in the Barossa, who were making reasonable quantities of dry red. And that coincided, and that's you know, one of the fortuitous things that happens to people sometimes, and particularly in my case, the fact that uh, I went there, and as I said, in 59, it was about 60 that the red wine boom began. So I was almost in the box seat to be able to make a bit of a name for myself as a dry red maker. So I found myself very busy indeed. Uh, the red wine boom started, so we were looking for more and more fruit all the time. And grapes at that time were one of those beautiful periods I'd love to see again where grapes are hard to get. <laughs> there was no surplus. And uh, through Dad, being a local pastor, and most of his parishioners were vineyards. I was able to wheedle little parcels increasingly so over the years, and all of these contracts were a handshake. You look after us, we'll look after you. I think 12 years after I joined the company, it was, was family owned. They sold out to Dalgetty, which uh, was an English, more or less, you know, the equivalent of a multinational. Then the rural industry went very badly for them. So much so that uh, in 77, the UK director sent a directive to the Australian people that unless you can get a guarantee or return on 20% of any funds invested, no deal. No phone call or anything as far as I was concerned. I suddenly opened the mail one morning, there was a letter instructing me to inform the growers that they would not be buying any grapes for the 78 vintage. God, you know, I just couldn't bloody believe it. And, uh, well, neither could Margaret. No. <laughs> Carry on, I'm starting to get emotional about this. The growers you grew up with, it's all part of your own community, <clears throat> and to have that chopped off at the knees. They asked me to send a letter to the growers. I refused to do that. So another member of the firm said, I'll do it. He signed it, silly bastard. He's dead now, so it doesn't matter. And so <laughs> Peter talked and talked and talked and um, to friends and relations and mainly so on. Mainly hers. Mainly my relations. <laughs> and um, Margaret's sister-in-law put in 100,000. While red wine sales had just plummeted, there was still a strong demand for white. I rang a bloke called Ray Kidd at that time headed up Lindemans. Uh, this is when we were setting up the whole scheme and I said, uh, uh, Ray, would you be interested in buying any uh, white wine for the coming 78 vintage? He said, I'd buy every bloody letter you can provide. So we agreed on the deal and having done that, I went back to Dalgetty's and said, look, explain that if we did the bulk selling to Lindemans, this could finance the vintage. They just did not listen. So uh, I think it was in that order, them having refused to listen, that we raised 180,000 as working capital. 
So uh, away we went and we made sufficient money not only to pay for the white grapes, to pay for the processing costs, but also to pay for all the red grapes. So the growers got payment in full. The new company, which we called Masterson, I don't know if you ever read the story of the Idle of Miss Sarah Brown, which they made into guys and dolls. But the oh, chief character was a black called Sky Masterson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we. The gambler. Luckily, a lady too now. People thought this was an absolute gamble. We were uncertain as to what growers would follow us down here. Someone asked me, uh, what sort of support did you get from your growers when you started here? I said, well, uh, Jesus Christ had 12 disciples and one of them done it him. I said, my percentage was better. <laughs> we had very few growers who did not follow us here. The first load was crushed on behalf of a bloke called Joe Fasina. Yeah. who, who uh, owned at that time Burn Castle, which is now Lungmile yeah. Winery. And uh, Joe gave us a contract to crush 1,500 tonnes for him. And uh, he saved our lives twice, actually, old Joe. I think we'd been crushing about five or six days. Andrew Weekend, who's still our chief winemaker, we sort of wept in each other's eyes and said, Christ, you know, this is going to be almost impossible and Joe turned up. He said, how are things going, Peter? I said, not too bloody good, Joe. He said, a little bit of money help? And I said, oh, I've got to deliver. He said, how about 50,000? So I said, oh, that'd be terrific. So Joe wrote out this check. Margaret was happy to be there and I said, Margaret, take this check down and photostat it. And Joe said, what do you do with my check? I said, actually, I'm going to photostat it and frame it. And uh, he looked somewhat displeased, and I thought, God, I hope I haven't broken some <laughs> bloody Italian code of honour or something, because when Margaret came back, he said, you give me back my cheque. Oh, it's absolutely hard stopping Margaret. <laughs> he took it and he tore it up, and I thought, oh, what have I done? What have I done? And he said, if you're going to frame it, you write it out nice and tidily. <laughs> oh, God. Which we did then. <laughs> and still, it's still like the copy of It's not the way of Many years later, when we were in Strive again, this was with the clouds, uh, on a Sunday morning, we were in real Strive. Joe rang up and said, you're a little bit of trouble, Peter. I said, yeah, we're in real Strive, Joe. He said, anything I can do to help? I said, yeah, you can, Joe. He said, what's that, what's that Peter? I said, lend me eight million quid. He said, the fuck a Peter. He says, that is a lot of money. <laughs> he spoke with quite a pronounced Italian accent. He said, I'll lend you four. And he did. And that gave us time to get up a prospectus and become a public company. So there have been some interesting times. Oh, Good Lord. God. But um, a lot of us and a lot of the people that you've been talking to have seen the swings and the roundabouts and the ups and downs. And what I know is that the Barossa is absolutely on a solid bedrock foundation. And if you stick to what you know you do really well and what you believe in, it shines through. And the younger generation that you'll be meeting and have met a lot of them, the Barossa is in very safe hands. I couldn't think of better hands. This has been Absolutely wonderful afternoon. Is that a nice You're not going to get rid of it. We would camp on the lawn if we could and hit you up for breakfast, but we won't. We will head back. But thank you so much. Yeah, for thank you. Your time and, and for sharing your stories. It's I think the joy of seeing people love anything, in our case, wine and the Barossa, gives me so much pleasure and would give her more because there's nothing worse than a bloody convert. Margaret is a convert <laughs> to the Barossa. <laughs> We're all converts according to you. Yeah, we can do